Hi, I'm James Downey. I was head writer at Late Night from Labor Day of 1982 through 83. Dave was the guy who made it okay to do smart comedy. Like when I was at Saturday Night Live, I'm very proud of the work we did there and everything. But the big difference was that Saturday Night Live wanted to be hip and Late Night wanted to be smart. Dave would do things that no one else in that age would have done in comedy. We were doing a thing, the theme of the show was we were gonna improve the set. This uh, unsightly cable runs out of the microphone and down under the desk, so sometime next week, uh, we're actually on the show gonna bore a hole right through there. So I, I wanted to mention that to you now because it's, uh, it was too late to get it in the TV guide, so. Uh, <laughs> If you want to, you know, keep the kids out of school a couple of days so they're well rested, we'll be actually on this show uh, putting a, well, about there, I guess, putting a hole. We'll have a high speed, maybe even a variable speed drill, and we'll just... <laughs> I was going like, I love this guy so fucking much. No one else in comedy would even try to get a laugh on, on the phrase variable speed drill. It was the kind of stuff Dave would just, you know, flick off. He wouldn't even remember it the next day. I remember one, one time John Candy was on the show. So the idea was that we had discovered there was a wasp nest in the set. John Candy comes in, it's like, let me handle it, Dave. I just saw him the other night in a movie. <laughs> David, look on the back of my neck. There's something crawling there. Yeah. Did it come from that nest? Well, it could have, yeah. It's a wasp. Yeah. Would you mind uh, kind of flicking it off? Just be very careful. Right. Okay, that does it. That does it. Now, I'm going to take care of this, David. Don't All right, get a long you. broom and an acetylene torch. Right. <laughs> John, you know, we could, uh, the, after the show, they can get it right out of there. Please, I'd like to just kind of warm them up there. There they are. That got them. That got them. That got them mad. That got them mad. Oh! 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 some more trouble with Dom DeLuise. Who knows? If yeah. All right, I got him. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay. great. Thank you. <laughs> you got some... Uh, They're all in here. You got some nasty... <laughs> Not to worry. <laughs> you got some nasty looking... Go on with the show. <laughs> no longer have a wasp problem on this show. One time, uh, and it's probably not as good as I remembered it, but they used to have these things, Teamo stores, which are like cheap cigars. And it had a sign in the window, come see the world's largest humidor. And that was the kind of thing we loved. We loved like goofy stuff like that. Excuse me, sir. Uh, are you here to see the world's largest humidor? World's largest what? Have you ever seen the world's largest humidor? No, I haven't. Any interest in that? None whatsoever. <laughs> The greatest, the timing was, uh, was beautiful. I remember one time, I had a friend from college who we grew up in Colombia. This was when Julio Iglesias, he was already kind of well known in Europe, but had not made any impact in the US. But you were seeing signs everywhere like, who is Julio Iglesias? The idea was we were calling randomly around the world to find out if people knew who he was. Buenas noches, Don Jose. Eh, lo estamos llamando de Nueva York, el programa de televisión Late Night con David Letterman. ¿Cómo dijo? What? Lo estamos llamando de Nueva York, el programa Late Night con David Letterman. El señor Letterman le quisiera hacer unas preguntas. Cuénteme. Go ahead. Okay, tell him there's a sponge in it for him. No, no, no. Uh, ask, him, ask him if he's heard of... Uh, uh... Dígame, ¿usted, ¿usted ha oído hablar de Julio Iglesias? See, he says absolutely yes. He's right. a famous Spanish singer. Does he have Does he have a copy of Julio's Hello. new hit? Hello, dígame, usted tiene una copia del hit más reciente the de Julio hit. Iglesias? Hey. His new hit. Que se llama Hey. hey. Claro que sí, yo guardo todos. Yes, he has them all. Can he? 
Can he, is he near, ask him if he can, is he near the record player and D then to play it for us. Dígame, ¿usted está cerca de un tocadiscos y nos puede tocar el, eh, la canción Hey? Sí, señor, yo lo tengo aquí con mucho gusto. Yes, mucho he'd gusto. be very happy. Oh, good. Cool. He's going to put it on. Oh, he's going to put it on yeah. now. All right, great. Okay. Great. Okay. So, uh, let's see, let's uh, get Here back to our map again. <laughs> sí. Can we hear? Yes, we can hear. This is coming all the way Columbia. from Colombia, all the way yeah. South America. <laughs> we did the Hall of Presidents one time. It was one of these museum pieces where like Dave would walk around with his foul cards and stop at an exhibit. I was the voice of the Martin Van Buren animatron. Ladies and gentlemen, from the late night Hall of Presidents, please welcome not Martin Van Buren, but an incredible facsimile, the Martin Van Buren animatron. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Don't be frightened. I am Martin Van Buren, the eighth president of the United States. May I remind you that there is to be no smoking or taking of pictures during this performance. Uh, Martin, you were the first president who was born in the United States uh, after the War of Independence, correct? That's right, David. I was born in 1782 in Kinderhook, New York. I see there are some folks here from Kinderhook. Thank you, David. But now I must be going. I must rejoin my friends in the Hall of Presidents. <laughs> right here, excuse me, Mr. President, are you all right? Leave me alone. I'm fine. It's just my bad back acting up again. This is very unusual. I'll be all right. We liked also populating the show with, like, repeat characters. We had a Bob Rooney day. Not everyone in the crew was worked to, to the bone every day. They seem to have a lot of breaks and leisure time. So, so the idea was, Bob, no, no, you're not lifting a finger today. This is Bob Rooney Day. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may or may not know, traditionally on Bob Rooney Day, we do what we can to grant this man three wishes. Anything this man desires, myself and the staff and the entire unit here at NBC will do anything we can to make them a reality. So at this time, Bob, I'd like to ask you, Whatever it is, world travel, riches, jewelry, a home in the Bahamas, give us now wish number one. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Rooney's first wish. Uh, I think I like a cold beer. A cold beer? <laughs> Can we have a cold beer for... Okay. Thank you. There you go. That's, thank you very much, Tommy. That's, uh, that's wish number one if you're scoring along at home, and, <laughs> and, and more than likely you are. Now, Bob... Uh, two left. What about number two? Uh, BLT. A BLT, ladies and gentlemen. Tommy, do we have a BLT for Mr. Rooney? Okay, Thank boy, you. there is eating at its finest. Uh, <laughs> all right, Bob. Uh, the tension is building both here in the studio and all across North America. Wish number three, Bob. What, what's it going to be? Uh, another beer. Another beer for Bob Rooney, ladies and gentlemen. Come on. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, I, I don't know about you at home, but so far it's just an unbelievable night here in the studio. Time for bed, Billy. But, Mom, it's only four in the afternoon. This isn't any way to celebrate Bob Rooney Day. <coughs> who, uh, who is Bob Rooney? Who is Bob Rooney? Dad, he's the assistant sound man on Late Night with David Letterman. Late Night with David Letter who? I don't believe I know that program. Yeah, you know, and uh, I think we've all had enough of this uh, Bob Rooney nonsense. Uh, uh, turn out the lights, son. Uh, we're history. My parents don't understand anything. Hey, kid, you mind if I read the newspaper? Wow, Bob Rooney! I'm on a break. Golly, Bob Rooney, my own house. This is the best Bob Rooney day ever. If I can only figure out my parents. Hi, Billy. Those two adults who put you to bed weren't your parents at all. 
They were just evil imposters. They've been sent to jail. Here are your real parents. We found them tied up in the basement. Oh, Billy, I'm just so sorry this had to happen on Bob Rooney Day. Oh, don't worry. I have a hunch Bob Rooney Day turned out just fine. Right, Bob? Yeah, right. <laughs> we would be sent boxes and boxes of T-shirts. Like, every college in the country would send us a T-shirt. One time I was on camera, we were doing a bit that Andy Breckman wrote, where it's premiering the next night's show. We actually brought them out and they did their best stuff so that it was ruining the next night's show, basically, by promoting it. He has Frank Zappa come out, who was always funny. Whatever Zappa did was funny. And then they brought me out to say, what comedy pieces will we be doing? I'm wearing a T-shirt from the University of Stuben. And so then we got a viewer mail. Oh my God, your head writer was was wearing a t-shirt from the University of Stuben. Dave says, well, well, we'll get to the bottom of this, I promise you, and it's, uh, uh, it's Jim Downey here, and so I, I'm wearing a t-shirt that says, kick me. Uh, Mr. Downey, is Jim? Jim, could you come? Uh... Yeah, Jim. Um, I'm sure uh, Kathy would be uh, interested in, in knowing uh, where you got the t-shirt the that said uh, Wazika and Steuben and so forth. Um, I've never even heard of the place. You, you didn't go to school there? No, never, never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, then how is it that you were wearing a shirt that said University of Wazika at Steuben? Uh, am, am I in some kind of trouble, Dave? Uh, no, Jim, no. This is just that we're trying to find out the origin of the shirt and so forth. Um, where, where did you get that shirt? Well, um, I don't know, but uh, sometimes I, I wear shirts without really reading what's on them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Jim, thank you very much. Thank you. It's Jim Downey over there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh... One of the things that I had really liked was a George Meyer thing, I'm absolutely certain. The giant doorknob. Like, great fun at parties. Number one a toy in Mexico, where it's known as El Nob Gigante. Oh, this is my favorite, by the way. It's the giant phony doorknob. The oversized jumbo no knob, oversized jumbo knob, is much larger than it should be. In fact, it's just plain big. <laughs> you just put this on your door, see? You yell, come on in. It's just plain big, all right? Giant. Giant doorknob, and, it, and this is made of pewter, so it won't wear out as fast as the other giant doorknobs. <laughs> so you'd never go through one of these things in a light year. Um, it didn't get a big response. I said to, to Dave, we should, we should do a thing where we, we sort of go, wait a minute, audience. We feel you did not show the proper respect for that joke. A sampling of opinion around the office indicates that perhaps you don't understand how truly big this doorknob is. So tonight, by way of comparison, let me show you a doorknob that perhaps you would find on a medicine cabinet. Here, then, is what we agree to be a normal-sized doorknob. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the giant doorknob. Huh? People, people have come up to me on the street and they have said, Dave, I've seen that uh, giant doorknob and uh, I don't think it's all that funny. Is it, is it even bigger than a bread box? Well, yes, it's even bigger than a bread box. It's... I remember having charts of like giant doorknob, man, Brontosaurus, you know, that kind of thing. Are you getting how large this thing is? You know, the one item that we've had on this show that has inspired the greatest amount of mail certainly has to be the giant doorknob. We received an especially thought-provoking letter just last week from a little girl in Portland, Oregon, and she wrote, Dear Dave, I am very frightened because there is such a huge doorknob in the world. It's just too big. I wish there was no such thing. Yours truly, Kimberly Adams. Well, Kimberly, we here at Late Night also wish there were no such thing as the giant doorknob. As you can see, there's no denying it's just plain big. And it also happens to be a little frightening. But, Kimberly, 
Who's going to tell our friends in the Kremlin to get rid of their giant doorknobs? <laughs> Take a look at this photograph taken by one of our high-altitude surveillance satellites. Computer enhancement and expert analysis reveal that the Soviets have been developing and deploying their own giant doorknobs. <laughs> Using methods that I am not at liberty to reveal at this time, the staff of Late Night has been able to get a hold of one of the new generation Soviet giant doorknobs called the SS-17. As you can see, the SS-17 dwarfs even the American giant doorknob. And while it is obviously less sophisticated than our version, its sheer size makes it another dangerous step in the insane giant doorknob buildup. Well, let me tell the Russians one thing. The United States will never just sit back and let the Soviets win the doorknob race without a fight. Unless a freeze on doorknobs can be negotiated, the Pentagon is prepared to deploy yet a larger giant doorknob. Thank you very much. And if this isn't enough, here's an artist's conception of what Boston and cities throughout the country will look like by the year 1995. <laughs> and when the doorknobs get this big, everyone gets scared, not just little girls in Portland. We here at Late Night wish to plead for some sanity for an end to this insane doorknob buildup before it's too late. Thank you. For a long time, the show was like embargoed, right? NBC, when they were punishing Dave for going to CBS by saying, then we won't let it, you know, because I inquired about, this was probably like 93, because I, maybe I, that's, I couldn't find the tape, and, and, and they said, nope, nope, it's all, it's in New Jersey in a lead casket that with triple, you know, fireproof doors. No, no one has the key. I don't have the key. No one, you know, was like, okay, fuck you.